this is obviously Easter Sunday, right? Um, And there are many reasons people come to church on Easter, and I'm thankful that you are here with us today, whatever the reason. And so if you've ever been to an Easter service, the big theme is the resurrection, and it should be the resurrection of Jesus. But, But I want us to take some time and to really consider the resurrection of Jesus today. And I want you to consider your relationship to the resurrection of Jesus. You see, the resurrection, it it actually was the most transformative event in all of history. No no matter what you think, no matter what you believe, um, no matter where you've been, it, it, it actually totally changed the world. And even people that don't believe Jesus will say this. And and so let's now come to the text and read the first part of the resurrection story today um, from John 20. So if you have a Bible, open it, turn on your device. Um, We're going to be in John 20. We're going to look at that first part, John 21 through 10. So again, open your Bible with me. Um, We'll go to John 20 and, and we'll look at those first 10 verses and just let the text soak in. The text says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. This is John writing about himself. (laughs) You'll see it's kind of funny later. And said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, John, and they were going toward the tomb. And both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. You hear John kind of being funny there? He said, I outran Peter. And reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead, Then the disciples went back to their homes. So if you saw in verse 8, it said that they saw, we're going to see this theme, see, seen, saw, okay? Same word, just conjugated differently, grammatically. And that they believed, that they had faith. And then it says, they didn't really understand the scriptures, that he must rise from the dead. And so today in John 20, 1 through 28, we're going to worship and learn That the resurrection shows believers true sight. True sight. We're going to learn that the resurrection also uh, shows believers true authority and to some disbelieving doubt. And so I want you to think of the statement, I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. This is the summary statement for our main idea in our text today. Again, think of this statement, I have seen the Lord. And then I want you to wrestle with yourself today and even encounter, you may even wrestle with the true holy God today. I don't know where you are. I want you to think about that statement, I have seen the Lord. Is this statement true of your life? And is this statement, I have seen the Lord, true of you today? What is your life's focus Where are you hoping to go in life? Who are you hoping to be? Do you have a vision for your life? Can you see where you're actually going? And if you can see, because we can deceive ourselves, right? Are you actually seeing correctly? Are you even going the right way? Have you seen the Lord or are you spiritually blind? You see, in John's gospel, the whole book, the whole purpose, it was trying to show us what true belief actually was. 
And many people have their own versions of Jesus or the, the, they, they went to church as a kid and people were mean uh, and, and, and they think, man, those Christians are like that. So Jesus is like that and it's fake and it's not real. I don't know where you are today. You see, the people in the text, we've got Mary, we've got Simon Peter, kind of an example of, of, of and then Thomas later. They were expecting their own version of Jesus. They were expecting their own version of Jesus' coming for the first time. Remember it said they did not know that he was supposed to rise again? They weren't like, yeah, Jesus is going to die. They were expecting their own version of Jesus. And you may be there too. You may have been to church your whole life. And you have a version of Jesus that you've written out in your, because of your thought, theology, your, the way you reason, the way you think, and you've written a story of who Jesus is. Jesus wouldn't do that, or Jesus is that, or G- my Jesus is this way. People do that all the time. But Jesus is who he says he is, and there's only one Jesus. We looked at that a few weeks ago. He's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father. It doesn't matter what your mom said, what your dad said, what your church, the old church said, what you said, what I say. It matters what God's word says. That's why we're based on the word of God. You see, people, we expect a different version of Jesus. They did not want Jesus to die. I mean, I'd probably just say, I would say the same thing. No, 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 Jesus, don't die. I'll die for you. I'm a superhero. I'll take it like Peter. They didn't understand. They didn't realize that his death, that his going to die, that it was actually part of God's plan. (gasps) Why would God do something? Why would God include death in his plan? Why would God do this in your life or that in your life? Why were you in this family instead of that family? Why doesn't your family have more money instead of less money? God has a plan. But you see, the death of Jesus was God's plan from the beginning of time. It's not like God course corrected. That's what we think. We're writing a story like, oh man, I messed up. I'm going to make the story a little bit better. It, God didn't do that. He was like, oh, Adam and Eve messed up. My bad. What do I do now? That's not the God. See, a lot of times that's the God that we are worshiping. That is a weak God. That God is the same God as the genie in Aladdin or something. That is not the real God. God is over everything and he's strong and he's powerful and he knows and he does things intentionally that do not make sense to us sometimes. Again, this was God's plan from the beginning. Before creation, God knew that Jesus would die and so our great triune God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit who were eternal, they were actually present at creation and and, and man was made in the image of God. In their image. And God knew that we were not perfect creations. God said, don't eat of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? What is actually the foundation of sin is that we want to be God. We're like, no, 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 no. I I want the knowledge of good and evil. I want to know good and evil. God said, that's not not human stuff. But I'm going to let you see. And Adam, which means man, Adam, the first man, was deceived, as was Eve. And and they fell into sin, and God knew that. That was part of the plan of God. They didn't catch God off guard. God knew that they failed and that they sinned, and they would pass on that that sin to all the rest of the Adams. You know you're an Adam too, or an Eve, okay? You are a human. It's Adam kind, or human kind. And Jesus actually says one day that Jesus is the, the, the last Adam, the last, the final man, the complete man, You see, we all have sin, and you see, all of our sin is what brought Christ, Jesus, to death. You have to know that. Like, your sin, not just your mama or your sister or the other person or that, that, you know, that uh, political party you don't like or those evil people or that, the people you get mad at, you, me, our own sin brought Jesus to the cross. He was perfect. He was the only perfect one. They, they could stare, with, stare at perfection. They were staring at perfection all this time and they couldn't see it. He was the only one who had power over sin. The only one who was tempted and had power. You see, our main idea is true. The resurrection shows believers true sight, true authority, and to some, this is the hard part, To some, disbelieving doubt. 
And so let's look at our first point today. That the resurrection, this is hopeful, this is exciting, it shows believers true sight, okay? We saw in the first part of the text, Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter, and John, they encounter Jesus' resurrection and that his body was not there. What a shocking, crazy thing. And to go in there and kind of stoop and look in and then go in and see that the, the cloths were folded nicely, that was not like, oh, yay, Jesus. That was freaky. That was scary. Like, oh, Mike, what is going on? And Mary, they can't even process that, that Jesus would rise from the dead. They didn't even know what was supposed to happen. So they thought someone stole the body. Look at verse 8 again. It says, then the other disciple, this is John, he's talking about himself, who had reached the tomb first, just in case you missed it. He's like, I was faster than Peter, and I, I reached the tomb first. I'm still faster than Peter, okay? That's what John, he's the one who wrote this book. He said, he also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yea, they, they did not understand it. He didn't even understand it all, but he was believing Jesus. And, he, and it says that he must rise from the dead. Then the other disciples went back to their home. So we think the other disciples were there. And then we see Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Look at the text in verse 11. It said, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. Mary is sad. Why? As she wept and she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in the other accounts. The angels were scary. Angels are scary. They're not just like little things floating around. Angels manifest, and, 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 and um, the Marys and the other versions were scared of the angels. They had fear. So angels put fear. We don't really see that here, but they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they, they, and maybe to Mary Magdalene, they have, at this point, maybe manifested as humans. And she says, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. They just thought someone robbed the tomb. Or or took Jesus' body away. And having said this, she turned around and saw. You see that? See, saw, had seen. She saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. A lot of times, Jesus is actually doing things. He's present in your life, but we we don't see him. We think it's something else. We think it's, oh, we may even think it's the enemy sometimes. Because God is trying to get you. The one thing I've seen with people in church is when God brings you to a, a, a pain point of growth, he wants you to grow, most people bow out. They quit. Nope. Nope. It's that church's fault. It's that pastor's fault. It's that person at church. It's my mama's fault. It's my work's fault. And, and it's actually, most of the time, our fault that we're not growing. God is bringing you a point to a point of growth, and he wants you to grow. He wants you to be more holy. He wants you to be more of a man and woman of God, and you, and you bow out. That's why we need Jesus, because our, te- our tendency is to bow out all the time. And God is calling us to be sons and daughters of him, men and women, that would turn the world upside down because of what he did. And so, verse 14, again, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And then Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? See, Mary was, was seeking. She couldn't see this Jesus that was resurrected yet. And then look, it even tells us her, 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 her thoughts, supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, she saw Jesus as the gardener, the Holy One of God, the one she had seen before. She couldn't even recognize him. Ever been there in a situation you're just so bothered or you're so mad or you're so this and you can't see Jesus and you're, you're not reading the word of God and you're not loving God and you're not loving people and you wonder why life is chaos and mess. I'm right there with you guys. She, it says, supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, now she's blaming Jesus, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Mary's like, I want to do this, serve. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic. The Bible was written in Greek. Aramaic was the language that the Jews spoke as a mixed language, similar to Hebrew. And she said, Rabboni, which means teacher. She saw him. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. He's saying, I'm going to go. But go to my brother's. The disciples and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. 
and that he had said these things to her. So look at this text again. Look at verses um, uh, 17, okay? This one can mess people up a little bit, and people have twisted this. Jesus says he's making a point. I'm, ex- I'm, I'm ascending to my father and your father. As a human, Jesus understood roles and authority. The humanity of Jesus was submitted to the authority of the Father and the Spirit. So how much more should our humanity be submitted to the Father? If Jesus, who was God in the flesh, submitted his whole life under the Father's authority, all the little things we do, all the idols we have, all the things we crave, he says, to my Father and your, he's making a connection And then he says, this does not mean that he is not God. People have twisted this. He's doing the same thing grammatically. He's saying, to my God as a human and your God, because Jesus was actually a real human. And so the time he was here on earth, he was submitted to the Father and the Spirit. Then verse 18 says, you see, Jesus was submitted to the authority of the Father and the Spirit. And Mary went out and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. So what is Jesus doing? Jesus is modeling God's authority in order. We don't, sometimes as humans, we don't understand. We want our authority in our order. We want things to go our way. And we don't bend to the will of God. God has an authority. And God has a certain order. Our our, our culture is totally against the created order these days. Right? Right? And so our first point today is true, that the resurrection actually shows believers' true sight. If you are a believer, you can have and you have true sight. Now, it can get fogged sometimes, but you have true sight, which allows us to see our second point today, that the resurrection shows true authority, okay? We, man, we, we can find and see authority in so many different ways and things. Maybe it's a coach. Maybe it's a good parent. Maybe it's a certain leader or a CEO or a business person. You're like, and there's some authority. Now, there's also the bad side of authority, right, where people abuse authority. Uh, countries, leaders, historically. But let's have the resurrection show us true authority. Authority that you guys can claim and you guys can actually walk in. You don't have to be scared. Look at the next. We now see that Jesus appears to the disciples. So the text says in verse 19, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, that's why we celebrate on Sunday, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. When he had said this, He showed his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And and this sent is is not just for the disciples. It's interesting too. It says that the door was locked. So this is where we get the idea that Jesus walked through walls. There's a point being made there. But. He says, I am sending you. And this is similar. This is a short version of the Great Commission. So in our mission statement, we love God. We love people. The Great Commandment. And and, and Jesus is saying here, he's saying to us that we must make disciples of all nations for God's glory. So here he says, I'm sending you out. Now listen, this is similar. Jesus is our model and our example. And so the resurrection story in the Gospel of Matthew ends in a similar way. Um, when Jesus speaks of his authority that he passed on to the disciples saying. So here he just says it kind of briefly. I'm sending you out. In Matthew, he says this, all authority, because we're talking about authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given, Jesus says, not to you necessarily, to me. Jesus has authority. Then he says, go, just like he says in John, I'm sending you, go therefore and make disciples, make learners. You don't convert anybody's heart. That's not your purpose. But you go and teach your kids, your coworkers. You share. The gospel must be on your lips. This is what it means to be a, a, a son and daughter who actually believes the resurrection. Go therefore, make disciples, not of people like you, but of all nations, all kinds of people. And then he says, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them, actually taking the time to teach them, to walk with them, to do what? To observe, to obey, literally, 
All that Jesus says, I have commanded you, the law. Do you love the law of God? Do you love the word of God? Do you know the word of God? Because if you don't base um, your belief on the word of God, the written word of God, Jesus, the living word of God, and the gospel, the proclaimed word of God, you're going to miss it. You're going to write your own version of Jesus. And, and we're going to be just like the disciples and Mary who could not see the real Jesus. And, and then you know what Jesus says. He says, just, it's my authority, but he says, behold, pay attention, listen up. He says, I am always with you. It's what he said in John to the end of the age. Jesus said, I am with you. You have my authority. If you know me, you have the Holy Spirit living inside you. And the Bible talks about this word power a lot. Power, power, power. Now, many um, people and Christians want to use that power, and they kind of want to use it like witchcraft. Like, look what I can do. I can heal someone. Boom. I can speak in tongues. Blah, 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 blah. I can do this. I can do that. That's, that's, okay, God can do that, okay? But that's not the power he's talking about. It's the power that may happen and manifest that way sometimes. The Spirit decides when that happens. But, but how about when someone says something nasty to you, right? And your instinct is to hate them or to come back with something sharp. Is it not more powerful to restrain or to say that word inspired by the Holy Spirit, to say a word that may be challenging, but it's also loving, to do work humbly, to wake up every day with the power of God to make it to the next day, to wake up and serve the church. You see, we have our version of power twisted. We want power the way uh, we see the Avengers have power. We want the power of Hulk. We want to break things, or especially men, right? I don't know about what woman power is. I don't know. You, you can give me some examples. But men and humanity generally has this power. We want physical. We want strength. We want to dominate. But the power of God actually may manifest in a different way. And see, then the text continues. And John adds, go back with me to verse 21 to see the similarity to this authority that Jesus gives. This power. Verse 21, it said, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. Peace be with you as the Father has sent me. Even so, I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, look at the authority now that they have. They are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. They, disciples now have this apostolic authority or this power. The disciples were now operating in Jesus' authority, which was the Father's authority led by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as believers, we have true access to this true authority, which is God's authority. Sometimes as believers, if you remember, there's a guy named Timothy. We're going to see about Thomas here in a bit. I don't know it's something about these names. I'll start with T. But um, Timothy was very ashamed. I mean, we think he was ashamed of the gospel because Paul has to say, hey, don't be ashamed. Thomas doubts. And so those kind of operations, operating that is operating in your authority and not in the authority of God. And it's a daily thing. It's a thing. One conversation, you might be operating God's authority, and the next one, you, you, you bow down and you're operating in the flesh. That's why we need to know how to abide. It, it, it's not just something that you, you do once, you get saved once, you get, do get saved once, but it's not something that you stop. You keep actually growing in holiness in Christ. It's a word called sanctification or becoming more holy. And this is what God has called us to. But many people are like, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I'm good. That's not what the authority of God looks like in your life. God is telling you to rip away sins, to rip away lifestyles, to rip away things that you actually love that are your idols. And he says, I want you to believe. I want you to actually have this authority. And so then our first point, that the resurrection shows believers, not everybody, but believers' true sight. And our second point today, that the resurrection shows, again, those believers' true authority pushes us to deal with this reality, okay? The reality of our third point today, that the resurrection shows to some disbelieving doubt. So let's look at verses 24 through 25 of our text today where we see now the apostle Thomas and his reaction of disbelieving doubt when confirmed with Jesus's resurrection. Look at verses 24. Verse 24 says, now Thomas 
one of the 12 called the twin or Didymus, which means twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So we don't know what he was doing, but he wasn't with them, the original coming. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Now they're proclaiming like, Mary, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, this is Thomas, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Man, what a, what a arrogant thing that Thomas says. He's like, man, I got to see it. Unless I see it in person, I know that he died. He's saying, I know that the Romans came and they put him on that cross and they beat him. This was not a sweet thing. We wear the cross a lot of times. It was like wearing an instrument of torture, the electric chair on your thing. And I'm not, I, I like crosses. I'm not saying don't wear them. But that's kind of what it is. It's a heavy thing. It's like wearing, a, a le- I got a lethal injection chain. That's what the resurrection was. The Romans would put people, not just Jesus, and they would, they would murder them. They would put them on that cross, and their body would be hanging, and there would be, there would be blood, and there would be pain. But it wasn't just the physical pain that Jesus took. That was part of it. Again, our third point shows us That the resurrection shows to some disbelieving doubt. Thomas is saying, I will never believe. I don't want to believe. Thomas is an example of the human heart, guys. He's an example of you and me. He's an example of what we do every day. So are the others in Christ. But in the flesh, we are all doubting Thomases. You see, Thomas needed to physically see Jesus' wounds to see or to truly believe. He had to see the miracle in person. And that's why historically he's known as Doubting Thomas. And if we're honest, again, we've all been there. We've all been Doubting Thomases at some point in our life. Maybe you're like, no, 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 no. I never, I never, I never deny Jesus. Like, Peter, I won't, I won't, I won't. But with your actions, the sin you've done, the disgusting things you have looked at and thought and done, me too, all that junk shows us that we are just like Doubting Thomas. We are guilty. I'm guilty. You're guilty. And we have all been doubting Thomas in our life. We, and, and because of this, guys, because of our sin, because of our brokenness, because we lack, we all have to deal with the truth of the resurrection's veracity, of the truth of the resurrection. We have to deal with it. We can't forget it. Like this is not just an Easter Sunday thing. This is an everyday thing. I love Easter, But in some senses, man, the tradition of Easter makes us not know that we have to do this every day and preach the resurrection every week. It's not just something we do on Easter. Easter is a reminder. Now let's look at verse 26 and see how Thomas reacts. So Thomas is saying, man, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. Now, this is another Jesus walking through walls. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Jesus wants to give us peace. He wanted to give his disciples internal abiding peace, not chaos, not I don't know what's going on, not oh, I feel all this stuff all the time. The stuff's going to come. But if you know you are marked with the spirit of God, you can operate in the worst situations with peace. That's what Jesus gives us. And so it continues in verse 27. And then it says, then Thomas said, we see his reaction. He sees him and he says, put your finger here. And and, and, I mean, then he, Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put put out your hand and place it in my side. And he says, do not disbelieve, but believe. Jesus says that to Thomas, and he's saying it to me, and he's saying it to you today. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And then he says something amazing. Remember, Thomas had to physically see, and Jesus actually gave him that. Jesus was was, um, for Thomas, 
who said, I, I, I'll never believe. Jesus says, no, you will. <laughs> and, and, and many of us, has, most of us who are Christians is because at some point we have actually said that in our heart. I'll never believe. I'll never believe. And God says, okay, you'll see. Jesus says, do not disbelieve, Thomas, but believe. And then Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God, he sees. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Awesome. Blessed are those who have not seen me and have yet believed. Jesus says there is a blessing for us, for you. We're not Thomas. We weren't there. Blessed are those who have not physically seen Jesus and believe. This is from Jesus, the king, the resurrected one. Jesus says there is a blessing for us who believe as true sons and daughters of the holy God who have not physically seen him. I don't know if you've ever come across this in the scriptures. This is powerful. We have this blessing, almost this different blessing than those that saw him. This blessing to live in this authority, to live as true believers, to be ones who don't doubt, who say, man, like Jesus called Thomas, do not disbelieve. You probably need to tell yourself that every single day. Don't disbelieve. Believe. It's the basic part of Christianity, but it's the thing that sustains you. It's the thing that gives you access to the power it's not Christianity 101, it's Christianity 201, 301, whatever the next college courses are, right? It gets you to eventually die, it gets you to PhD level where you still don't actually PhDs end up, you, you know less. But you keep growing and you keep growing in Christ. You don't master believing. You're always believing, you're always wanting more of the love of God. This is where Christians fail and they will stay baby Christians their whole life because they, they don't believe they don't keep growing in belief you have that childlike faith is great but Jesus didn't say have childlike maturity okay (laughs) did he childlike faith not childlike maturity he says eat meat and many of us are content just drinking milk and God says he'll still save you but he wants more he wants you to have authority he wants you to have true power and sight through him and his holy spirit Again, if you believe Jesus, if you actually believe Jesus, he is talk. you are in the Bible right there. You're in the Bible on Easter Sunday. He's talking about you, that you are more blessed than Thomas and the disciples and Mary. Hmm. What a blessed, blessed privilege to receive and hold on to this Easter Sunday. Not to be proud. He should actually make you humble. It's like, man... A lot of times I, I wish I could have been there, right, or lived in Jesus' day. And he says, you guys have missed it again. You're actually more blessed to live in this time. He's, we looked at it last week. You will do greater things than me, Jesus said. He's like, the authority is there. The power is there. The access is there. Go play, sons and daughters. Go play. Stop playing the games of the world and play in the kingdom of God. God has called us to play. He's called us to live, to have eternal life. He said, you are blessed by him. And for those who do not know him, this is not a condemnation on you. I don't know who you are. There's hope. You can actually know the true God of the universe today for the first time. God is clear. Because... Like we learned in our first point today, the resurrection shows true, it shows believers true sight. If you do not know him, you can know him. You can have this true sight. We learned today that that the resurrection shows true authority. And then again, for some, the resurrection shows to some this disbelieving doubt. And so the resurrection, again, it actually shows believers true sight, true authority, and to some disbelieving doubt. But John says this. After, I didn't put these on the screen intentionally because I wanted us to look at these. John 30 through 31. Join with me. The next few verses after our text. John states the whole purpose, the whole point of writing his whole gospel, which is probably a good summary for all the gospels in all the Bible. Look at what John says. Again, remember what Thomas wanted. He wanted to see. He wanted to see the miracle up hand. And, and, And Jesus says this, and John says this, John says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, 
I, I can't even imagine what those things are. There's crazy stories out there of things that Jesus did. He walked through walls we see in John. Who knows what else he did? But John said, I'm not going to give you guys that. He said, that's, that's not the point. Jesus is awesome, okay? But he says this. He says, Jesus did many other signs or miracles in the presence of the disciples, not in front of everybody, but in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these, the miracles, the story of John, the, the miracles and the story of Jesus are written here. So what? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the actual Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing not just believe, believe one time. Believing grammatically is this verbal word that means I-N-G, right? It keeps going. You don't just, you just believe once. You're believing, okay? Bad English. You should be believing, right? That you may believe that Jesus is the actual Christ, the resurrected one, the one that was prophesied, the Son of God, and that by believing, you don't stop. You may have life in his name. A lot of times we just but want to believe once. And then the rest of our life, there's no power. There's no having life in his name. Because we're not believing. Jesus is saying, believe. It's an active thing. That's why we do communion every Sunday. To remind you to repent and believe. And so then I want you again to think of this statement. I have seen the Lord. I want you to wrestle with that again and possibly even wrestle with the holy God right now in your seat and think about the statement, I have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord as the disciples say. And is this statement true of your life? Is the statement, I have seen the Lord true of you today? I mean, right now. What is your life's focus where are you hoping to go in life? Who do you really want to be? Do you have a vision for your life, a plan, a goal? Can you actually see where you're going? And you might be, yes, I know. I know exactly where I want to go. And then God comes in, puts the mirror there and says, are you even going the right way? Have you seen the Lord or are you walking in spiritual blindness and deception? Do you see the resurrection correctly today? Do you see the resurrection correctly? And does it show you as a believer the true sight of who Jesus is and, and who you are as a broken, desperate sinner that cannot save yourself, that needs Jesus every second of every day? Do you see Jesus as holy and great like we sang? Do you see him as wonderful and good? Does his majesty point you to see the triune God, the, the full understanding of God? Some people twist it and just only worship Jesus or only worship the Holy Spirit or only think about the Father. No, we have a triune God who is one, but the, the, he's manifested that way for a reason. Do you see the true eternal God of the world from Genesis to Revelation? And does the resurrection give you that true sight? That you are actually sinful and I am fallen and we are undeserving of God's grace and mercy that he actually gives to us as his babies generously. Do you see the resurrection shows true authority of who God is and in how you're actually to live your life? Is your life filled with Jesus' authority? Is your life filled with Jesus' authority leading you, directing you, shaping you, and challenging you, and saying no to you sometimes, and changing you, actually transforming you? It's the first thing on our website, let God transform your life. You may be like, oh, a churchy phrase. No, like we act Christian, non-believer, be transformed for the first time. Or if you're a Christian, that you would come every Sunday, every week, and be more and more like Christ, even in the brokenness. It, it, it's kind of like the stock market sometimes, right? You put money in, the thing is going, you're doing good, and then it tanks. But if you keep investing, if you keep putting that 1000 a month, 3000 a month, you will be rich because when things get hard, you're actually buying more stock. You actually become richer because it's 
stock market could totally go down and this analogy never worked. But historically, for 100 years, the thing comes back up. And that's why the rich stay rich, because they invest when it goes down. And then they have just bought more stock. And now they are, same thing spiritually. When things stink, when things are hard, are you investing, doing the things that God has told you to do? Are you believing him? Are you loving him and people and making disciples of all kinds of people? Are you living for God's glory? Because if you do that, man, when the harvest comes, you're going to be richer and fuller of the things of Christ. Does the resurrection show you his authority, which allows you to live empowered by the Holy Spirit, which in turn allows you to live, guys, that abundant, full, this is the word that God, this eternal, abundant, full, complete life in Jesus, a life with victory over sin that is abiding or living in Jesus as he lives uh, in you where you're loving him and loving people and you're actually investing or making disciples. You're making followers of Jesus of all nations for God's glory because he is the authority in your life that allows your life to function with actual godly authority and not human weak authority to do what God has commanded us to do in honoring him in, in, in loving your family and loving your friends at your job at home in all the ways God has called you to steward what he's given you and do you see the resurrection and does it lead you to, to, to belief or to disbelieving doubt? The question you can ask yourself every day for the rest of your life. You see, there is a way of God and the way that is against God. And the resurrection of Jesus is so powerful, so historic, it's so amazing, it's so humble that we are called to see the gospel. Some won't see it. But we are called to see the gospel. We are, we are called to see the proclaimed word. That's what we call the gospel the story of God, if we have seen the Lord truly, the story that he created and he knew what he was doing, that we were fallen and broken and that Jesus came. So we could say, I have seen the Lord. He was perfect. He was perfection, lived out for 30 something years and they could not see it. And then God said that the son must die, that the wrath or justice of God because of our sin and all humanity was put on Jesus and Jesus was tempted just like us and he took on the wrath or the anger of God because God is the only one that could have perfect anger. You guys can do it at times as well. If someone comes and uh, uh, slaps your kid or slaps your mom, you're gonna be like, hey, that's not evil, that's righteous anger. So God has righteous anger in a way that we can't even understand and that's what God had to do with sin. That's why he put it on his son, the sacrifice. Going back to the picture of Abraham sacrificing his son, that this Jesus would be sacrificed and he would die a horrible, bloody uh, Roman death on a cross. And he would lay Friday, Saturday, and Sunday he would raise again. And, and that he said, don't hold on to me, Mary. Don't cling to me because she's right like Jesus, Jesus. He said, I'm coming back again. And that's the hope we have in Jesus. He says, one day there will be no more pain, no more suffering. And more than that, he said there will be a new heavens and a new earth. The old has passed. That's what he's already says in salvation now and the new has come. We, will, we won't just be angels floating around. We will be actual living beings again with new bodies. Whatever body I think you wanted, God, you're going to be like, oh, not bad, me. <laughs> not, thank you, Lord. I actually look how I hoped I look. I don't know what our new bodies are going to look like, but I think it'll be something like that. You're going to be like, whoa, check me out. Thank you, Jesus. And we're going to actually live again. This is like a test saying, do you truly believe? Will you live the rest of your moments and your days for the, 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 the pointless things of the world? Or will you, will you cling? Like Mary, I think in her actions, she's right, clinging to Jesus and then remembering he's coming again. Believe. Believe in our king. We'll end here. Again, the resurrection shows believers true sight and true authority into some disbelieving doubt. So see the resurrection correctly today, guys. See it today. Don't leave here today seeing it wrong. Have the true sight of truly living for the true triune God through Jesus' resurrection. Don't live the rest of your life in apathetic or even worse, deceptively passionate doubt that is worship of other people or other false gods. Don't do that. We're a false Jesus. But see the true God, the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. See his resurrection correctly. See Jesus who gives you authority to live with his power through his Holy Spirit. So live in the identity he gives you. You're not some other identity. 
of your own creation or, or, or whatever someone has told you you are, that you're this thing or that thing and it hurts, right? Or even in an arrogant way, wow, you're that, you're this. That's not who we are. Our identity is in Christ. You're not someone else's projected identity or your own self-perfection. Your identity is in Christ. So live like it. Your identity is in seeing Christ, truly believing in him. It is the authority of Christ, guys, that identifies you as his true child who actually gets God's inheritance. We don't get Jeff Bezos' inheritance. We don't get all the rich Bill Gates. We don't get all these people. We get Jesus' inheritance. We actually get it. So live. Live. Let's live as ones who can truly proclaim, I have seen the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you are this holy God who we encounter, and, and uh, even my name, the, the name of your people, Israel, wrestle. We wrestle with you because, Lord, our flesh. And we don't want to see you correctly, Lord, and, and if we're honest, we don't want to give in to your authority. We don't want to know your authority, but you said that you have given us access. We have this blessed privilege because we have not physically seen you, but we have seen you in a deeper way, we've spiritually seen you, and through the power of your spirit, you live in us. And so, Lord, let us just respond now, humbly, Lord, in, in worship, in song, asking you, Lord, uh, just to minister to us, Lord. We need you. We love you. And, and I know, Lord, there are many things going on probably in people's hearts. I, I'm sure the enemy is... Um, fighting right now in people's hearts and souls to not believe, to have that disbelieving doubt. But you are stronger than that. So before we, we um, even come, Lord, and in, 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 in take communion, Lord, we just want to recognize who you are. Recognize your holiness in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.